Welcome to the ITSB Magazine Podcast Network. You're listening to a new episode of Secure Your Strategy Podcast, where your host, Chloe Mestagi, provides strategies to leaders and managers on how to repair critical issues in security and tech. We're glad you've tuned in. It's time to secure your strategy and your stakeholder approval. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. My name is Chloe Mistelli, and welcome back to another episode of ITSP Magazine's the podcast series called Secure Your Strategy. And with me, I have Debbie. Debbie, tell the lovely people out there who you are. Yeah, well, thank you so much, for uh, Chloe, and thank you for inviting me on this podcast. I really like the stuff that you guys are doing. So my name is Debbie Reynolds. I'm the founder and uh Chief Data Privacy Officer of Debbie Reynolds Consulting. I work at the intersection of privacy and technology, and I tend to work with organizations that are either developing or implementing some type of emerging technology that has like a higher privacy risk. So that may be AI, that may be metaverse stuff, uh, just all types of wacky things that people want to do with data. Well, I'm going to just start with the the first question, which is, so you're a founder of an of an organization that goes and helps and improves security. And so the thing that goes through my mind is, how did you even get to that point where you want to start your own consulting business? What were those things that led up to it? You know, well, uh, I've been in the data area uh, for well over twenty years with the with the emphasis on well, right, in air quotes, a long time. Uh, And as I was working on my career, all through my career, I've worked with companies on things like digital transformation. So back then it was called transformation. So people were moving from analog systems to more digital systems. Um, And as I started working on that, uh, I worked with a lot of corporations that were doing digital or data moves around the world. So I had to know a lot around data privacy. So oh, you can't, you can do this, but you can't do that. And then um, company, people who knew me from that work started calling me about privacy stuff. Uh, so one of the biggest companies that was one of the first companies to call me, asked me to talk to them was McDonald's Corporation. So they heard me speak at a conference and say, hey, why don't you talk to our corporate legal department about this new privacy law in Europe called the GDPR? And it wasn't even out yet. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was the start. And I thought, you know, I get so many people who call me about this. And it would be cool if I could just do this and not some of the other stuff. So that's why my focus is in, in privacy or in, in data. That's really interesting. So basically from speaking at a conference, you locked down a McDonald's out of all the companies. And that's pretty cool. And got into privacy. And then how how did you start growing? Because I know everyone always sees like publicly that whole iceberg situation. Have you seen those graphics where it's an iceberg yeah. by the name? <laughs> it's like so much others. Yeah, um, but you only see the top part. So, what were some of the things that when you made that decision? Okay, I want to do this like full time. How do I go about this? What were some of those motions for you, and what was that time process look like for when things started like really moving fast? Yeah, I would say I started getting this interest. I started deciding that I want to focus directly on privacy in tw- like twenty fourteen. So between that time, uh, probably about four years, I will say, um, I did like a lot of speaking. I did a lot of writing. There just wasn't a lot of information out there around privacy. So I did a lot of that. I did a lot of those things. And then I think the acceleration happened um, in May 2018 uh, when the GDPR came out, because I've been talking about it for many years. Hey, this is coming. You need to think about it. And uh, actually someone from PBS called me and asked me to be on television and talk about GDPR. Hey, this is new law that's coming out. What do we need to know in the U.S. about it? And people still call me about that interview that I've done on PBS. So it's pretty cool because a lot of my predictions came true. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so 
That's that's really cool. Now I'm gonna have to get that link of that interview and then share it around. By the oh, way, oh sure, oh thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> Okay, so I was just talking to someone earlier today about the pain of GDPR. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you have found in a way to help people reduce their stress about thinking about it? Like, what is something that you find that has simplified it for others? Well, I find that people are overwhelmed by it. You know, it's not a short law, it's hundreds of pages long. But I think people get overwhelmed about it because they think everything in that law applies to them. And that's not true. So depending on the type of business you you are in, not everything applies to you. You really need to focus on that and not get overwhelmed. Also, what the GDPR is really trying to do is bring transparency um, to how companies handle data of individuals. So if you're fighting transparency, you're going to have problems with GDPR or any other law, right? So I think that's the issue that corporations have, where in the past, it's like, once they obtain data from someone, they didn't have to tell them what they were going to do with it, and mm-hmm. they never had to create that transparency. So I think, you know, uh, stop thrashing about and stop <laughs> trying to get away from the whole transparency thing that's like the wave of the future and that's part of what people what we're seeing people vote with their feet right or vote with their money so their companies are seeing like apple um i don't think it's it is a coincidence they have some of their biggest quarters ever once they um introduce app transparency which is hey you know, if you want to use someone's data, you have to ask them first. You have to tell them what you're going to do. And so I think, you know, especially the OS makers, definitely Apple, um, uh, Google is trailing about there, but but they are definitely trying to create more, uh, more guardrails for companies and how they use data and also creating that transparency for users. So, you know, think of GDPR, things like that not as a tax, but an opportunity to be more transparent. Yeah, I know as like myself as a buyer, I love to see things that are transparent. So whenever I'm like buying clothes and I'm trying to decide between two different companies, I'm looking into seeing like, well, how were you made? How was it manufactured? You know, transparency about all that. The more transparent we can be, I think, especially younger generations are very much about like, wanting to know what's in a product and also where their rights are, their privacy. It's interesting to see mm-hmm. that uh, like the TikTok conversation is like really taking off these days. Even though I know InfoSec has warned about TikTok for, for years now, but now it's like really catching up throughout mainstream, I would say. Have yeah. you had a lot of conversations with like family, friends about TikTok? More conversations just around colleagues around TikTok. Uh, I don't have any, I don't know of any family members who are actually using TikTok, but it's a super popular app. I think, you know, countries like India, they a long time ago, they banned TikTok. Um, I think even China's trying to ban certain things about TikTok, which is crazy, right? Uh, but I think, people are really watching the conversation um, because TikTok or BitDance, they can change their the way they operate anytime, right? So that's what regulators really want to do. Um, so I, I frankly don't see uh, them banning TikTok in the US, but I think that they want to force some changes in how they operate. And that's possible, right? Yeah, no, it definitely is. And what do you see like kind of the future for GDPR in the next year or two, especially with like the rise of AI and, and chat GPT? Yeah. Well, GR- GDPR is not going to change. It hasn't changed in the last five years. I think people are looking at it a bit differently because as these new tools come out, maybe there are things that did not apply to their company before that now do based on the types of data processing that they're doing. So I would say take a fresh look at, uh, you know, anytime you're you're bringing on a new tool or a new technology, chances are it may be touching data in ways that you weren't previously. Um, and I, to me, the parallel I'll make is for companies that never, let's say, for instance, they had um, 
time clocks or ways that they check people's time and attendance. Maybe they did it on the internet through forms. Maybe they threw, did their punch clock. But some companies are now doing biometrics, whether that be retina scans or um, thumbprint, uh, things like that. So even though those companies may say, hey, this is a new way to do things, but that creates more risk that you need to really think about. So it isn't a like for like exchange, right? Because mm -hmm. you think, oh, I was doing the same thing before. So I implement this new tool and then I don't have to do anything else. Uh, and that's not true. So <laughs> I, I think with any, anytime you're bringing in new technology, anytime you're collecting more data than you have before or in different ways, there may be implications that you had not thought about with these different laws and different jurisdictions based on uh, whose data you have. And then what are, what are the common issues that you find when it comes to your customers? Like things that are, you see all the time. Yeah. I think a common issue, people don't understand the laws that apply to them. <laughs> so they're like, Hey, I didn't know this applied to me. And I think in the U S is even harder because it's like, Oh, Illinois does something different than California. So mm -hmm. I have to change what I'm thinking about or, there are two new laws that are coming on board and on the state level, and I have customers in those states. So how is that going to impact me? So I think a lot of times people are are shocked about how they have to make those changes, and they're not aware. So they they may be um, on autopilot in some way, and this is especially the case with companies who are using marketing. So maybe they over the years built like this huge, complicated marketing thing. It works really well. But now some of the things that work really well that they had done in the past, maybe they're no longer legal. Uh, so yeah. you have to really look all the way through your stack to see, you know, what is it that we're doing? How we're using data? The people the, like maybe you're using a third party company, ask them how they comply with these laws or how they're going to help you comply with those laws. I think those are all great questions to ask. And I think I see a lot of companies get in trouble um, you know, I think we saw like a Sephora settlement. It was like the first uh, uh, first enforcement action in California with CCPA. It was only a million dollars, but a lot of my legal lawyer friends, they were like just totally up in arms about this whole Sephora thing. And people always talk about it, right? Because it was like the first enforcement. Um, this uh, Sephora got in trouble for some like automated advertising that they had al always done and had never changed and, and they should have changed or should have looked more closely at what they were doing um, so that they could comply. So I think one of the biggest problems that companies have is like, they think, oh, if I just continue doing what I'm doing, then I'll be fine. And it's like, well, no, because the regulations are changing. So you need to take a closer look at what you're doing and make sure that you're in line with, with the regulations. Yeah, I have to admit, I think one of the things that irritates me the most, I've had a couple of instances where there's no unsubscribe buttons in an email and it's spam. And I'm just like so frustrated because I'm like, stop sending me this. I don't want this. And there's nowhere to unsubscribe. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really bad one because like unsubscribe has been around forever. Like there's like no way in on the word. I get those too, where I'm like, what? getting this i hate this so there so in the u.s we have we have mostly been a notice country where um unlike the the eu where they have to consent they have to have an opt-in mm -hmm. so that you have to opt into marketing in the u.s you don't so you get a lot of stuff because they know that they can't they can do it and there's no law against sending you stuff and then some people don't want to, maybe they think, oh, we're small. No one's going to report us or something. And we don't have an unsubscribe button. It will be annoying. Uh, but but any and all places, uh, companies should have unsubscribe, period. So, yeah. it, it, you know, especially, definitely in the U.S. and especially in other countries. I don't think that, you know. I just personally think the companies that don't have that, they just think, oh, well, I'm going to fly under the radar. Yeah. No one's going to like call me out on this or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. There's like this one in particular that I keep unsubscribing, but it's still subscribing me. It's like 
because there's like 25 different things to unsubscribe. And I did, I hit each single one, but then there's these other ones you have to go somewhere else in it. Oh, it's so frustrating. Like I look forward to having more of the European way of life. Here yeah. Most of this stuff. And, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, I'm looking at a couple of tools that are really interesting that hopefully can help with this because it really shouldn't be you as a consumer's responsibility to go in and like uncheck 25 boxes and then try to fight your way out of this because you know it's basically you against the machine so you can't really out fight like these ai systems and they make it super hard for you to opt out which is a huge problem in the u.s where in europe they're trying to pass laws where they're saying hey you're the way people opt in and they opt out should be just as simple so they can opt in with one button, they should be able to opt out with one button. So I'm hoping we have more stuff like that here in the U.S. Do you find that California is trying to go that direction at this time? California hasn't really addressed this particular issue. They're just saying, you know, if you, uh, th there's no opt in unless you're a child. Uh, so opt, opt in consent is for children. Even though next year they have a law that's coming in place where they're going to make opt-in required for, uh, right now it's required federally for anyone under 13, right? Now they're going to, in California, they're going to try to, in California and a couple other states are going to try to make it uh, 18. So from 13 to 18, which is a big deal, right? So yeah. this is the TikTok, the Facebook, the pen, you know, Instagram folks. Uh, this, this is like the hot audience that all these you know gamers and stuff like that so they're probably pulling their hair out right now that they have to do opt-in which is really hard right uh, but you know the europeans have done it and they do it for everybody so we shouldn't like be so upset about that um but i think i'm hoping to see um you know i'm hoping to see more focus on opting in uh, as opposed to opting out because I think that definitely gives people more power. That's what Apple has done with their app transparency, done it in an opt-in fashion. And so they were like the first to move in that direction. So I'm hoping to see other companies move in that direction. Not yet seeing states do that except to focus on children. Uh -huh. Do you think like the future is going to be basically everyone's going to have check marks and they like on social media where everyone has to verify with their photo ID at some point with all the bots and, and impersonations of other folks. I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, I don't think so because I think you have to, I think what's going to happen is the consumers are going to have to weigh the pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. So if you download like an app that you're only going to use for 20 minutes, like you probably wouldn't want to give them your ID. And you're like, who are you? Like, why would I trust you with this, right? <laughs> But maybe something, maybe a service where you, maybe a company that you work with where you have multiple services with, maybe you'd be willing to do that type of identification. You know what I'm saying? So let's yeah. say, let's say Amazon. So let's say you have Amazon Prime, you have video, you order stuff, maybe you go to Whole Foods or something like that. And you said, and they say they want to do they're not going to force you to do this identification, right? But maybe they'll say, hey, you know, to make your account more secure or we'll give you like a $10 coupon, you know, why don't you verify yourself? I can see those companies yeah. do that. But, you know, for the most part, companies pretty much know who you are. And I feel like if they're asking for your ID or something like that, it's more of a data grab in my yeah. view, uh, as opposed to, they know. I mean, they yeah. know... They know that you went and had coffee this morning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they know exactly who you are. So yeah. that's very true. Cause like um I travel internationally and the thing I remembered was like a couple of years ago, you would have to alert your credit card. So on your app oh. or something. <laughs> now I do it. And I'm like, it's like you don't need to do this anymore because we know it's you using the card. I'm like, <laughs> Okay, so it, it is knowing everything that you're doing and the coffee you had this morning and all that. I think like one of the interesting things is um so in Oakland, oh, Whole Foods there, they uh they now have like uh fingerprinting. So if you want to do fingerprints, then you don't have to pull out your credit card or ID or anything. You just need to have fingerprints. So now you go up to the cash register and you just put your hand on it mm -hmm. right before it. 
I haven't done it. And it's mm -hmm. really interesting because I don't think it's very successful in Oakland because people are already nervous as it is to give away information like that. So, but I know it, they started doing it in New York City and other metropolitan areas. Yeah, they tried to do it a couple places here in Chicago. And we were like, nah, no, we don't like that. Uh, <laughs> and I've seen a couple of shops in some airports where they're like, oh, we're cashless. And oh, yeah. You know, you come in and you give us your biometrics and those are very empty stores, I think. People are like, that's not worth it. All I want is like a cupcake and I don't want to have to give this information, right? Um, but then also, you know, I guess one other practical thing that maybe companies aren't thinking about is that, you know, with COVID, people don't want to touch stuff, right? So you don't want to touch anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that'll be really a hard sell especially in just the regular consumer sense. It would have to be something like going to Fort Knox or something where they're scanning your eyeballs or something like that. <laughs> but, you know, anything that we're, that you have to touch, I don't think it's like going to be very successful. Yeah. Yeah. I just wish that, you know, people still continue to wash their hands after using their public restroom. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Because so I thought this was the most hilarious thing was the fact that at men's restrooms, like, oh, during COVID time, it took just as long for them to use it as women were in their restrooms because they were washing their hands. And then now they are like, there's no line, really. Like, I think they said like 30% of people actually wash their hands in the men's restroom. And I'm just oh like, God. oh, my God. I just think of RSA conference is shaking all these like, yeah, hands are just being like, oh, my God. Yeah, I I exactly. That's oh, that's so bad. That's so bad. Uh, you know, I could have probably assumed that. But that's such a bad statistic. Come on, people. <laughs> we didn't learn anything from the pandemic, clearly, <laughs> Debbie. Like clearly. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I don't want to touch anything. Like yeah. and and yeah, and I I wonder if they're gonna take away the whole thing at the Whole Foods in Oakland because I don't I haven't seen anyone use it. Yeah. Well, I will say one thing. Amazon is very persistent. So if they can't do it one way, they'll do it another. Maybe they'll do facial recognition. But yeah. that's obviously that's less uh, accurate, right? Yeah. But, Definitely. you know, I'm all about the touchless. You know, maybe if they had created that with the Apple thing, they would be more in favor of it. Like, I like that. Pay with my yeah. phone or pay with my watch or do the proximity card and not have to stick anything in, you know. Well, so I, I think I, that's I, that's better. I look forward to the day where you don't have to bring your wallet, period. Like, so in California, you still, we don't have a digital ID yet that we can use. Right. Like, if you go to a bar or anything like that. So, you're still mm -hmm. lugging that wallet with you, which seems heavy. That's right. That's right. You know, it sort of messes up when you want those little cutesy purses and stuff. Can't yeah. fit your wallet you in there. Can't. can't fit yeah. your wallet in your account. <laughs> can't fit like two or three things. No. In it can fit your cell phone, maybe, just yeah. <laughs> maybe, but you know, you're going through your wallet, like what cards do I need to bring with me today? <laughs> Cause I only have two slots. <laughs> I know two I have slots. a friend, she, she brings a T she loves these teeny purses and I tease her. I'm like, how, what the hell can you put in that thing? So she actually has like a backup purse with like everything in it. And then she has the little teeny one that she can kind of run around with. But I'm like, I can't, I, my whole, my wallet would not fit in those. No. <laughs> Not no, definitely all. not. This is why we need pockets in her like pants that actually fit cell phones and also like dresses. I know at any time yes. I have a dress and there's pockets, I am totally showing that off because it works so well and it absolutely yeah. I don't know why women's clothes don't have pockets it's like we need pockets oh my god we probably carry less purses if we have pockets maybe that's the reason they want to make sure we still buy purses yeah <laughs> we still need to spend our money <laughs> on purses oh my god <laughs> it's that's a conspiracy so theory it is here. a conspiracy <laughs> The guys, their pants have five or six different pockets. They right. probably have 10 pockets on any given day. And I don't have one. No. <laughs> and it's great because sometimes when you get those jeans, it's like, oh, great. And then you wear it and you're like, oh, no, these are the fake pocket jeans. Right. Why? <laughs> and, the, and then you check the back pockets and those are like super tiny and they also are like fake pockets. And you're just like, I don't understand. Who thought about this? It was a terrible idea.
Well, I know some people, they wear the girls sometimes they'll have, if they have a pocket, it's too small, right? So they have a back pocket and they try to put their phone in it, but it's halfway hanging out. Like someone's yeah. going to like take it from you. Right. Exactly. Like you put it in your back pocket because that's the only pocket it fits, but then like someone's going to come from behind and then you're just going to be like, okay, who's risk my twisting today? Like this that's is what's right. going to end up happening. That's oh, right. Gosh. That's right. <sighs> Yeah, someone needs to get on that problem quickly. Yeah, that's quickly. a that's a big one. It is a huge one. P- guys don't understand. This is like a yeah. big deal. No, oh they God. don't even have to wash their hands, apparently, no. <laughs> without feeling shame like we would have to. <laughs> so funny. I'm going to think about that when I'm at the next <laughs> conference. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, so Debbie, back on privacy here. Which is, what state do you think is doing the best when it comes to protecting consumers at this time? Good question. Um, I think the typical answer would be California in the U.S. because they, they're doing so much, which they are, right? And mm-hmm. I think they've been very progressive over the last, I don't know, 50 years, I would say. Uh, so, yeah, they, they can definitely get a vote for that for being very comprehensive in the way or they've been dealing with privacy and layers so now they have like a layer cake of privacy of all these different laws which is cool uh but the state and maybe i'm just being uh having my favorites because i'm uh from chicago so probably my favorite privacy law in the u.s is uh the biometric information privacy act um and it's probably the most hated law by companies uh (laughs) Because it is, um, it has a private right of action. You don't have to show that you've been harmed in any way. So the harm is that someone's misused your biometric information. Um, the fines are pretty high. I think it's like over a thousand dollars. I always forget what the number is. It's pretty high. So it's like the number is like let's say a thousand dollars times every time someone cl- collects your biometric. So. If you work, have a job and you work and you, you know, use a punch in time clock and they misuse your data, you could get a thousand dollars times or whatever the number is times how many times you did that. That's another reason why corporations don't like that law. Um, uh, employees are not exempted. Uh, so a lot of law privacy laws, if you work for a company, you don't have those rights. Right. And so Illinois, you do. Um, we've seen a lot of companies like, uh, Facebook, Facebook was the first one to pay like the biggest fine, uh, or actually the the biggest settlement for BIPA, which was $650 million for the state of Illinois. And as a result of that, they stopped, uh, collecting biometric face scans of people, uh, in that way. So to me, it's been very influential. Um, it's definitely made changes. A lot of people still hate this law, even though it's about the simplest law you've ever seen. It's like four pages. It's basically saying, hey, people have rights. People are humans, right? Not, so it's not just a consumer law, it's a human law. So you don't have to be a consumer of someone to actually get damages under this law. People's biometrics can't be changed and they're, they should be protected and you have to be transparent. <laughs> that's like all it is and like people are like going crazy about it right uh, that transparency think, right <laughs> I think a part of the reason why uh, companies don't like it is because it's very different from typical the typical way people think jurisdiction jurisprudence is done so it's like hey you have to let the person know before you collect the data what you're collecting it for and how long you're going to retain it and so, again, this goes back to companies who never had to do that, right? They're like, okay, let's collect it, and then let's not tell people how we're going to retain it or whatever. And that's how Facebook ended up in this this uh, quandary. Uh, you know, that's a very simple thing to say, I think. <laughs> I'm going to collect your data for X, and I'm going to keep it until Y, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because... I think a lot of times when we have these conversations around like TikTok, for example, um, I think a good number of people also tend to forget about all the things that Facebook has done in the past when it came to like data privacy and also Instagram, like all those 
have been guilty at some point of collecting something that you didn't want them to collect or you didn't know that they collected. Yeah. Meta or Facebook or Instagram, they've been they've been influential in privacy regulation in probably a way that they didn't anticipate, which was whenever they had these issues or infractions or organizations or jurisdictions started to create laws against the things that they had done basically so a lot of so um facebook was often in trouble with third party data transfer so data collected by facebook or meta and sent to someone else by some means or whatever and almost any law you can think of right now that's been created probably since 2018 i would say has something in it around third party data transfer so that's like a big issue. And I think a lot of that is because of Facebook. I can't stand those third-party resellers of all the data. Oh my God. I don't know. Anytime you search your name or something like that, and it shows up where you live, your phone numbers, like it's just, it's so aggravating to see that. And I I really give kudos right now because Google, they now have it. So you can, they have a beta going on right now that you can actually tell it to remove it because it contains personal data, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. Yeah. We need more of that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Especially some place like Google where the majority of people who do searches on the internet use it. So that's like a huge thing. Definitely. Okay, so Debbie, what is the one thing that you wish that every CISO knew about data protection? I think, oh my goodness, can I name one? Uh, you can name one or you can name two. Okay. I'll make it easy. Um, let me say, may, oh, let me do two then. So one is, I think what every CISO should know is that doing cybersecurity doesn't cover privacy. And a lot of people think that. They think, oh, once we do cybersecurity stuff, then you know we have privacy cover. And it's just not, these are things are not the same. They have a symbiotic relationship, but they are not the same. Uh, so a lot of a lot of times people, especially in the US, they confuse cyber with privacy and they are not the same at all. Right. So um, you know, I tell people think about cybersecurity as like, let's say, let's say you have a bank. So cyber is protecting outside the bank, inside the bank, you know, who's in the bank, who's doing what in the bank, right? And privacy is about what's in the vault and why it's in there. So cyber can't do that, right? Because you, you're not as entrenched in those details. And it's very, very much based on humans, not necessarily in the data of humans, right? That's what privacy is about. Where cyber is protecting all data, right? Of a corporation, regardless of whether it's human or not. And then I think the other thing I will say is that privacy isn't just a legal issue. Um, You know, companies, they have privacy issues. Um, You know, I say privacy is a data issue that has legal options legal implications is not a legal issue that has data implications so if you think of it that way then you have the right mindset about how to attack that problem well thanks debbie for being on here this was a lot of fun i have to get you back on here again especially if there's any privacy changes that happens or whatever happens next with social media or anything like that or the return of the hand washing. We find out the statistic is a little bit better, hopefully, by then. That's right. That's right. Happy to be here. and Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'll catch you at the next episode. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Secure Your Strategy Podcast with Chloe Mastagi, part of the ITSB Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share this channel and itsbmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.